Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Emil Berthollet. I'm the chairman of the Louisville Historical Commission. And uh, I wanted to say on behalf of Margaret Carroll, I really miss her. And I thank her for everything that she's done for this town, really. And uh, she's a great, great lady. And she taught me a lot. And thanks to her, uh, Margaret asked me to join this uh, committee. And um, also because of that, I did a presentation a while ago on the uh, growth and prosperity of Millville. If you want to see that, it's a YouTube presentation that uh, Tim and Jesse uh, with the uh, Millville Cable Access put together. And look at it. And Margaret will be on there, and uh, you know it's a good memory from her for her. And in there, Margaret mentioned that we were going to do little snippets of information for the town that you can review. It'll be on film. It'll be on YouTube and on the Millville uh, access, Cable Access Channel. And we're going to do five presentations. We did one, the Growth and, Pro growth and Prosperity of Millville. Um, we're going to be doing today, it's going to be the transportation uh, that happened in the town of Millville. We're going to do one on the trains, one on the canal, and uh, uh, one on the, uh, uh, the meeting house in Millville also. So those are the five that we're going to do. And uh, today, the uh, presentation will be done uh, by Bob Bowen. He was nice enough to come in this afternoon and do this presentation. And uh, I'm excited about this happening today. And I'm sure you will as well, especially the viewers online. So uh, I don't want to hold up uh, Bob, but uh, Mr. Bob Bowman, I want to turn this presentation over to him. Thank you, Bob. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you, Abel. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. How do you do? Uh, yeah, I'm Bob Bowen. Uh, I was the baby of the Bowen clan, and uh, Mil Millville was uh, always in my heart. And uh, my father, and uh, after World War I, which my father was a, a candidate for the United States Army, and he did a two-year service over in Europe, and uh, coming back, he, uh, his heart and soul was set on opening a garage for auto mechanics and whatnot. And uh, so he uh, opened, bought some property down on Main Street, and it was always called 20 Main Street from that time. And uh, so he built a garage and uh, an office building. And uh, at that time, in 1929, or 28 actually, uh, Millville was forced to transport the tree, uh, students from Chestnut Hill downtown because there was no school at that time. The little building wasn't uh, uh, thought of at that time. Uh, well, I think they had two grades up there, first and second grade. And then the upper grades were at Longfellow. So anyways, my father had a chassis and he said, maybe we can take and convert that chassis into a school bus and transport the students, which he went down to a stadium garage on Clinton Street in one socket. And uh, the building is still in, in occupancy at, at this day. And anyways, he uh, talked to them down there and they said, bring the chassis down, we'll take care of you. And that was this bus here. And that was always called the chicken coop because uh, they, they, Aunt Blanche, she was one of the patrons and uh, uh, students. And uh, every time they got down to the school, uh, the kids would all holler, here comes the chicken coop, you know, <laughs> and from Chestnut Hill. So that's stuck for years. And then later on, uh, more demand started to come in about transporting to the mills because the uh, trolley cars that were coming, one came from one socket up as far as uh, Millville and he did a dovetail and went back to one socket. The other came from 
uh, white uh, Uxbridge, and he came down and did a turn around and went back to Whitensville and Rockdale, up through the valley to Worcester. And, uh, but they were phasing out because the vehicles started coming in and uh, the operation was you know, getting to be expensive and uh, the, uh, they couldn't furnish the, uh, the electricity enough, you know. So that's when uh, they confronted my father and they said, how about transporting the mill help, you know? So he looked into it with the ICC and Mass DPU and uh, they said, well, you have to do this, this, and this, and uh, had hearings, which he did. And uh, so he wound out what they, what they called the grandfather ICC rights, which enabled him to broker his own charter trips. If he uh, wanted to send a bus to Boston with people, I had an irregular route, they could do it. Uh, on a per head basis. And so anyways, that's when the second bus came back, which uh, was actually a hearse. <laughs> and uh, so he, he had that transformed into a bus and it was a parlor coach because it had comfortable seats and curtains in the windows. And uh, so he got that and then the the flow of business started booming like hakes, and uh, he uh, called White Company because they had the bigger buses, and the uh, salesman come down and he specked out all these buses here. And uh, so he needed three of them right away. They said, we just so luckily have three on the lot they looking for a buyer. So he bought the three buses and uh, he ne needed more buses because more mills were looking for the, uh, the extra help and all. And he got uh, two more, which gave him, he had a five of those white buses and that's uh, bus one and bus two. And uh, then more uh, mills became available and then the, uh, the people up at Uxbridge, they said, well, we live in Millville. We go to Uxbridge, Worsted, Stanley Willen, uh, uh, Stanley Willen, Scott's Mill. So anyways, uh, that meant more buses and more help. And uh, so, <coughs> excuse me, he uh, ordered some of these white, uh, he bought two of these suburban buses and then this, the outskirts of Blackstone, East Blackstone, they were demanding bus service. So he bought the Jitneys, which they were in, from uh, 8, 12 to 14, 16 passenger buses, stretch outs. He had two Chevrolets, two Buicks, and two uh, Pontiacs. But they were expensive because he was always running people to the uh, Woonsocket Hospital because you had about five, five doors on each side of the car on the big stretch outs. And then so somebody got out, they you know, didn't think about the guy next to him. He slammed the door and bop him in the head. And uh, you know, it was a comedy, I guess. And uh, they'd break a window and something like that, you know. But uh, then he phased those out because uh, he got them beat primarily because the roads, like uh, Menden Street and Blackstone, when he ran the East Blackstone bus up there, well, it was up as far as maybe JFK school, it was blacktop or oil and sand. But from there on in, it was all gravel and boulders and that. And that took a big toss task on uh, all the buses because they were breaking springs and always replacing them. And the maintenance was crazy. But anyways, uh, and then as the years got on, the buses became a little better because 
you get uh, the, uh, let's see, we're out now. Uh, yeah, this one here, they came, General Motors came in with the, uh, what they call a parlor coach. They were getting, they had the curtains in the windows, if you see. And uh, that's where my job came in. I used to have to sweep the buses out and pull the curtains back and put the snaps on them and uh, fuel them up and, you know, and uh, once in a while I'd take them for a road test. You know, I was 12 years old. <laughs> the Uxbridge cops caught me up at Uxbridge with the bus. So I got my ears pinned back on that. But anyways, it was a laughing matter after. And uh, then we, he started buying the, the gas buses. That's all they had at the time. The diesels were perfected for the buses, you know. But later on, he, he did uh, think about buying the diesel buses. But uh, I, I was gun ho for them because, you know, the cost of the fuel was pennies versus gas, you know. And uh, he says, uh, no, no, he, he was in the old school, nothing like the old gas bus, you know. And uh, so I had to do some trickery in order to get him here to give either diesel buses because we uh, belong to uh, Massachusetts Bus Owners Association. And once a month we had a meeting in Boston and uh, so two of the guys that were on the committee with me, I was secretary. They were the Anzoni brothers of Plymouth and Brockton. And uh, so it, we got pr pretty friendly. And he says, how come you're not going diesel? So I told him the, the stone wall I'm against. He says, I'll make a deal with you. I'll give you a good price on a diesel. Next time you come up, bring a dealer plate and I'll take the bus run it, you know, it's okay. So anyways, I did the following month I went up and uh, brought the bus home. So my father says, what are you doing with that? I said, we're gonna buy it. No, 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 I'm not buying them, you know. So I said, oh my God. So anyways, I called, and my wife didn't even know it. I called uh, Harry Seagraves. He was the president up at the, or the accountant up at Uxbridge uh, uh, Bank up there. And uh, so I called him, I said, can I make a home improvement loan? Sure, he says, you know. So <laughs> I, I said, okay, bring up the papers, I'll go up. So I told him how much I needed. Okay, he says, you know. So anyways, uh, I started up there. My father stopped me, he said, what, what are you gonna bring that bus back to Plymouth? I says, well, I'm going to buy it, you know. No, you're not. You know, well, we argued. And I won the argument. He says, okay. So that's got us introduced to the diesels. And uh, then, you know, we started buying them to p keep up to the times because the, p the, the people uh, were, you know, muddy. Uh, the bus school runs like St. Mary's and Milford. Uh, these were up uh, above and beyond the Blackstone uh, and Woodsocket. Then uh, in 1960, uh, UTC was going to phase out their Woodsocket routes. And I said, I, I convinced my father and I went, we went to the hit, you know, we had to go be, before the Chamber of Commerce and the city council and the mayor and all. And we finally got it uh, because they, they backed away from it, UTC did. And we took over all of the Woonsocket operation and Woonsocket to Pawtucket. And then between that and the charter work, it was really booming. And we had to get more vehicles, which we did. And uh, we wound up with uh, some good accounts, uh, Worcester Polytech, uh, Dean Academy. Uh, I had a three-year contract with the Pawtucket Red Sox for their transportation. And uh, 
let's see, it was, uh, <clears throat> we ran excursions every Sunday in the summer times. Uh, Rocky Point, Crescent Park, uh, Lincoln Park in, the, in Bedford, Mass. Uh, oh gosh, uh, Ocean, uh, Ocean Beach down in New Hampshire, uh, Connecticut rather, and uh, uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, and the other uh, was uh, uh, Mount Snow, ski trips, Loon Mountain, and uh, so anyways, it, it became, you know, a good uh, heavy duty uh, deal. And then all of a sudden, uh, the help situation got a, you know, I couldn't get the help, you know, drivers that were needed and everything else. And it was wearing on my family. <laughs> so uh, that's when I said, well, we, d we decided to sell because the, you know, the demands were, were there, but you just didn't have the uh, equipment or, or the piece personnel. So then we, we did sell it, you know. But uh, we, you know, gratefully to the town of Millville for, you know, letting us. And uh, because some of the fairs, uh, they were, they had the tickets and they were, you know, 15 cents a ride and uh, 10, 20 cents from uh, Millville to Woonsocket. And uh, so if a kid had a dollar, he could uh, get a round trip and a theater ticket to Park Avenue, uh, Park Square, uh, Park, Park Theater, and uh, Stadium Theater, Olympia, and uh, Rialto. Those were the movie players. So uh, anyways, that, that brings us to a close of a, you know, the uh, Bowen bus line operation. Oh. So this, the whole operation mm -hmm. was just in the town of Millville. Yes, yes. Headquarters, maintenance, yep. storage of the buses, and all of that. Yes, yeah. Wow. Yeah, and we had to, my, my dad had to uh, incorporate in both Massachusetts and Rhode Island because of the ICC, you know, mm -hmm. and... Uh, so that kept us a few going. In fact, some of the drivers, he's a le legend here, Gigi Glennon. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, he, he's my bus driver. Yeah, oh, he's, down, yeah. yeah, getting his 40 year driver's merit. And these are the people from, actually all but two of them lived in Millville. There was uh, Gigi Glennon, Alvin Stone, they used to call him Stoney, and Michael Bowen, Sr., Reuben Fossey, Olaf Norby, he was a Millville, Millvilleite, he lived up on Hill Street, yeah. and Jiggs Jigair, Michael Bowen, Jr., Freddie Crook, and Nedza Sweeney, they were all drivers. And uh, this particular picture right here. Margaret Carroll took that picture. That was up in Hampton Beach, New Hampshire. And because uh, they, they, they were running Sunday schedules on trips up to different places. Now, I, I see some pictures of a, a dealership, a Chevrolet dealership up there. I didn't realize there was a car dealership in Millville. Yes, yes. Is yeah. your family ran that also? Yes. Yeah, he, uh, he started out at, his first dealership was uh, Cadillac. And uh, he wanted the Chevrolet, but they, they said, oh no, there's no room for another Chevrolet dealer. Uh, Marku and Monsaka will take care of it. But 
they said, hang in there. We'll... So he says, well, Millville's a, a mill town. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, you know, people are not going to buy Cadillacs. He says, we're working in a textile mill. Yeah. Well, hang in there. He sold one car, and it was told, sold it to himself because he needed a, a, a limousine. And uh, so then after, they said, well, they, you can open up a dealer. They'll grant you the uh, Bowen Chevrolet or a Chevrolet dealership. But there was a lot of restrictions on it. But he took it anyways. And uh, uh, on Main Street, the same. Uh, the garage is pretty much the same, but they took the offices. The new new owner took the office part of it down. It's just a, it looks like a, a plane hangar, and uh, that my father had built for that. You know, and uh, yeah. So then he started selling Chevrolets, and he was doing a good business of it. You know, and he always said this because I said to him, I said you. You're into too many things, I said. You got the oil business, kerosene and fuel, the Chevrolet agency, car repairs, bus line, the farm. He had a farm up in, uh, actually it was just over the Uxbridge line, and but most of the pastures were in Mill Millville. And uh, then he had a diner up at Uxbridge Center it used to be Lynch's Diner, and he had that. So he was into everything, but he said, well, a good little business is better than a big bad business, you know? And I found that out, you know? But How many employees did he have at the peak of the bus business, Bowen Bus Line? Oh, God. Know? He had about 35, 35 people, full-time, part-time, you know, and... The part-timers were, were good, reliable people. And, uh, you know, they they give you a good day's work. Uh, you know, they didn't work an hour and want to get paid five, you know. They, uh, they uh, were good like that. But uh, we, uh, I had incidents myself on some of the buses, I'll tell you quickly. Uh, one of the accounts I got uh, it was during the expo uh, down at World's Fair in New York. New York yeah. And we were so busy because we were running one day trips and uh, weekend trips and so forth and so on. So anyways, this bus company up in Webster, direct, direct line, we used to help one another out in busy times. And he called me up and he says, I, I got a one-way move for you. Pick up Nichols College, take them to uh, Trenton, New Jersey, down in Bordentown. It's a football team, just drop them. And he says, I contacted a school bus, bus driver down there. He's gonna take care of them for the weekend. It's Cause I told him, I said, sadly, I, I'm, I'm booked out, you know. So uh, I said, I gotta be back for that, you know, trip to, sad, uh, to New York, no, no problem. <coughs> so anyway, we started down and we stopped off in Milford, Connecticut, and then he wanted to stop somewhere else for coffee break and stuff like that. So finally I said to him, I said, you know, I gotta get you into Bordentown and I gotta get back and I gotta get my rest for, for tomorrow, you know? Oh, no, no, he says, uh, you're going to stay with us for the whole weekend, you know? I said, no, no. I said, the agreement was drop you down here. So anyways, I pulled into Howard Johnson's, and uh, he went in, he says, you guys stay in the bus, I'll go get the rooms all straightened out. So he, he went in, and I'm sitting there, and I'm saying, boy, the traffic is getting heavy. I could see it on the Jersey Turnpike, you know? So anyways, uh, I said to the guys, come on, I'll open the bulkheads and you can get your stuff out. So they all started getting out. The guy comes out, what's going on, the coach? So I, I, I'm going to get out of here. 
So anyway, I closed the compartments and I figured I could go around no good because they had a fence at the end of the Howard Johnson's motor lodge. So I had to turn around and come back. He made me stop. He had them chain link, you know. So anyways, I finally, they got away from that and then I saw my getaway and I did. I got out on the Jersey Turnpike. The state trooper pulled me over. I said, oh my God. So I said, what's going on? He said, oh, he says, I said, did I break a, a rule regulation? No, no. Just left your, your party down in the Howard Johnson Motor Inn. So I showed him the charter order and so forth. So he says, uh, I said, I suppose you're going to you know, invite me back there. He says, I don't man tell a man how to run his business. Have a happy trip, he says, get out of here. <laughs> so, but anyway, Nichols College, they found out that it was me, and uh, they came down and they wanted to do business with us. So we got them as an account. So uh, that was one of the uh, things that uh, happened. And then the other was when the Beatles came to Boston, we were doing business with a Grace Travel Agency in Wellesley. And they called up and they said, we need a bus for the, for the Beatles, you know. So anyways, the Beatles themselves were, were in limousines, but the bus took, uh, I had the seamsters, the barbers, the business a agents, and uh, the public relation people. I had about 30 people on the bus and I had two state troopers with firearms. They had them all fixed. And one of them, Sergeant Murphy was his name. And he says, you know, he says, I was here when President Kennedy came for his, uh, he, uh, what the heck was it now? Uh, boy, I, my mind went blank about, he got his fellowship, uh, uh, one of the colleges? Yeah, from uh, Boston College. Oh, yeah. degree? Yeah. And uh, so anyways, they, uh, uh, I had to pick them up at Suffolk Down. And uh, this, this sergeant told me, he says, I never saw as much uh, security as what there is for these people. But because one of them had made a remark about we're more, pro, we're more uh, famous than Jesus Christ does, you know, and then, so people were frowned upon that. But anyways, uh, we, uh, I couldn't even go. I had to stay in the hotel. I couldn't go down. I wanted to walk down the street to get a coffee. Couldn't do it. Uh, so because of the security part, you know. But anyways, uh, that was quite an experience there. And Can I ask you, where was the bus barn located in Millville where you kept all the buses? Uh, to the, uh, Main Street. That was on Main Street also? Yes. Is that building still there? It's where yeah. it's it's Diggs is. is. Huh? You know what Diggs, D-I-G-S? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. All right, that's it. That's where the bus line was. That's where the bus was. All right. Yeah. 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 And, and the oil business, the uh, pictures of the tanks are, and this photo here, they had three oil tanks. So that, that's the, the history of the Lord was Tell me about the street that you told me, the story about the oil tanks. Oh, yeah. The, uh, uh, they used to call it Sinclair Avenue. Uh, the road between Ch Chestnut Hill Road and S Main Street. It was a cement uh, roadway. And uh, so we, that became, because my father, when he uh, started into the oil business, he had uh, Sinclair Oil. And uh, so that's, uh, that's why they used to unofficially call it Sinclair Avenue, you know. And, 
But we had to uh, close that off once, once a, one day a year so that it wouldn't become a public domain. Oh, okay. So, so Bob, you keep mentioning you and your dad. Was there anybody else in the family involved? Yeah, I'm sorry. I overlooked my brother, my brother Michael, because after my father passed away, Michael, my brother, he was running the business along with my father. And then he, uh, he ran it, and then he got multiple sclerosis. So he, he got immobilized. So I, then I took over the operation. And, and uh, it was my decision to stick with my family. And <laughs> the, the children were getting too much for Ellen to handle alone. So. <laughs> What year did you sell the business, and who did you sell it to? Uh, yeah, we, we, we sold it in 1971 to a whiner. Uh, he was a driver, and you know, I I had skepticals about it, but I didn't want you know I didn't want to see people that had transportation, and and all of a sudden because I had an idea. He was going to do that, and he he we did he uh, didn't uh, uh, run the buses the way he should have, and people what little ridership you had, it, he just got other means of transportation, you know, and it was completely wiped out. Well, in 1971, you had more cars too, right? That's so, right. So your ridership went down. Yeah. yeah, and that was the other thing that my father told me. He says, you know, he says, for every car I'm selling, I know that's at least 10 passages. You're losing as a bus patron, you know. Yeah. And that's, that became a reality, you know. But that's, that's good old America, you know. Yeah. Anybody have questions? Not me. I'll save mine till we get home. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank you, Emil, and the board for you know inviting me, and I stumbled a little bit here, but that's okay. Tell us about the hat. Oh yeah, that yeah. That's the uh, the new style badges that we had, and these were the old style because they were, if they were on the hat, every driver got confronted. They think you were a policeman because it had the eagle on it, you know, like a police would. Uh. Yeah. Anyways, uh, those were pre-war or pre-World War Two, so they. They earned their keeps, you know. And uh, we had tickets for uh, all the routes that we covered, you know. And uh, people, because textile workers or mill workers, they, you know, they didn't want to have a full pocket full of change. All they needed was a ticket. They'd buy it like on a Monday, and that would be good for 10 round. So they, went, so they went to the main office on Main Street. They bought their tickets? The bus drivers all were equipped with their various tickets. Millville to Woodsocket and Blackstone to Woodsocket. And inner, inner city Woodsocket. So, wow. Yes. Very interesting presentation. Yeah, it was very, very good. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, boss.